Welcome back to A Time to Think. This uh, series of episodes we're calling Media Diet. Media Diet. Uh, Chris, do you like thinking about your diet? Sometimes. <laughs> Other times I don't. I feel shame and terror. How, yeah, how many of us, like, we don't want to look at the diet in the past. We like to let the idea of the future. Like, yeah. That could be a good diet, but yep. if you're like, write down everything you ate last week. Then no. No, we're not no, friends anymore. I'm not going to do that. No. <laughs> Pastor Chris, I'm Pastor Josh, um, sort of this podcast so we could take some time to step back, observe things that are happening around us, and hopefully think meaningfully and, and guide others to think meaningfully about some things that we don't think about, like uh, the ways in which we consume media or the ways we are affected by media. Uh, some of these ideas popping out of Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death, where he says something interesting, Chris. He, he's writing in the 1980s, and he talks about how when te- the, the advent of television, a lot of people said things like, what is this going to do to us? Mm-hmm. How is this going to change things? What's going to happen? Yeah. And he was like, 15 years in, no one's talking about what television is doing. They're just Correct. talking about what's on television. Yep. And so he, he has this phrase, the medium is the metaphor, which simplistically he's trying to say, we can't only focus on the content, but the delivery of the content, mm-hmm. and that even the delivery of the content on a television tells us something about ourselves. Right. And so he steps back, and he's trying to say, can we talk about the television again? Can we talk about uh, image-based news? Mm-hmm. Can we talk about these things? Um, and in the same way, we're in a media-saturated culture with uh, computers that we work on that have media on them, phones that we text on, TVs at the ready everywhere. There's just media everywhere. TVs uh, and refrigerators even. Is that a I thing? It's a thing, yeah. That's neat. Yeah. See, that's the thing. I'm thinking, that's neat. I don't <laughs> need a TV in my refrigerator, Chris. Um, but there, it's so ubiquitous is a great word for media. It's everywhere. Um, and what's funny is you read a guy like Postman, you think, oh, you're being so particular about these things. And maybe you're listening to this thinking that we really need to think about the difference in entertainment versus informing and we're saying yeah you do like we're willing to be annoying (laughs) yeah in order to be helpful um and so we're going to try to annoyingly in a few episodes talk about things that we're probably just used to Mm -hmm. and one of them chris is the entertainment nature of most media yeah now josh you were a newscaster entertainer you were an entertainer. <laughs> Actually, one of the reasons I probably was on the morning news is because of the entertainment value I brought. Mm-hmm. I wasn't... Uh, Explain your entertainment value, Josh, as a person. Um, I wasn't... A, I don't think I was a particularly astounding reader of news. I don't think mm-hmm. someone looked at me and was like, man, that guy is so well-trained at reading news. Um, I don't think I was... I mean, at the time I was on TV, I was kind of losing my hair. Like, I don't <laughs> think I was that particularly attractive. Like, I don't think anything about me was... Like we gotta have him. Other than people tended to watch me on TV and go, "Oh, I have, I, like, I, I feel good. Like that's a jolly. They have a good relationship." You know. <laughs> that's a jo- jolly. Interesting. Interesting. No, seriously. So I, I think I, I, I might have mentioned this before. I don't think I would have been as good on the evening news because mm. there's a, there's a more severity to the sure. evening news and more playfulness to the morning news. Um, so if you asked me why I tended to be well received in the morning news, I think it had to do with playfulness. Mm. I. And that was one of our goals is someone's going to wake up. uh, We might be the first thing they watch. You want to entertain them the first thing in the morning. Yeah, realistically. Yeah. So, Chris, reflect a little bit on um, entertainment culture and how that bleeds into – we can start with news. Because we all know that sports is entertainment. Mm -hmm. We all really know that, like, social media is primarily entertainment. So let's start with a thing that's not supposed to be entertaining, like the news. Yeah. So I I guess I've – I've witnessed this as somebody who entered a period of life where I started thinking about significant things significantly mm-hmm. um, around the time where this this page got turned in culture. So when I be, when I began college in the year 2000, it was the year in which um, President George W. Bush beat Vice President Al Gore. You almost didn't begin college then because of Y2K. Yeah, exactly. Y2K, I mean, everything would have would have stopped, but thankfully they... they uh, Wanted pulled. you to get to school. Yeah, exactly. This guy's got schooling <laughs> yeah, to do. Need to do it. So, you know, I started college that, that very fall. Um, I was involved with President Bush's campaign in 2000, 
And what was very interesting was that everybody wanted to know, if you, if, if you remember that election, <laughs> there is a phrase nobody ever heard before, hanging chads, mm -hmm. hanging chads. And so everybody got obsessed with what's a hanging chad. And they saw these images of Florida recounting ballots because of hanging chads. And was this an actual vote? Was this not a vote? Mm -hmm. Went to the Supreme Court. Prior to that election cycle, entertainment existed within politics and news. It truly did, because when, when Ted Turner started CNN in like the 80s, um, it was the first time that news beyond C-SPAN was a 24-hour cycle. Mm -hmm. You could tune into the news all the time. Prior to that, the news was something that was uh, cultivated, curated, and brought to you on a regular basis, but it was always the same time, and entertainment was mm -hmm. apart from that. So... When, when I started hitting my late teens in the year 2000, I got to witness this shift into news as entertainment. Mm -hmm. The first name that comes to mind for me is Bill O'Reilly. Um, I don't know if you ever watched or read anything Bill O'Reilly did. Bill O'Reilly... Clips here and there. Yeah, I mean, he was on... I think he was on Inside Edition, which was, for all intents and purposes, it was almost like the National Enquirer, of um, of news, and so Bill O'Reilly came out with a format of of news on Fox News that was driven by um, I wouldn't say bombasticness, but it was a heavy hitter who would dig deep into stories. But he also had this thing, the no spin zone is what mm -hmm. he called it. And so people tune into Bill O'Reilly not just because he was a good journalist, and legitimately was a good journalist, but because he put a spin on the news that became entertaining. Hmm. And, starting and that was during the no spin zone? Or yes, the no spin zone was the only time? Was, the no spin zone was, was what he kind of termed his whole Bill O'Reilly show, okay. the O'Reilly factor, was the no spin zone. So you come in here and you're only going to get the truth. You're only going to get the hard-hitting truth. You're only going to get this. Well, even that in and of itself can be questioned, yeah. but the point was there was a spin in the no spin zone. There was the spin of the no spin zone that you were drawn into, and so the news was filtered through this guy's personality mm -hmm. and how he did things. And so then from there you get all these other networks who really start popularizing the idea of whether it's Rachel Maddow, um, whether it's uh, uh, you know Tucker Carlson now on Fox, whether it's Anderson Cooper – there's personality that's put mm -hmm. in front of the news. Which, interestingly, mm -hmm. think about just th think about the fact that we have news shows named after the person. Yeah. Yep. You know, like, and people, I even in the last five years, you change it to Tucker Carlson Tonight, the Ben Shapiro show. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you have to have the name yeah. because it's not just about the news, it's about the person. Yeah. And the person is, is grabbing your attention. And, and funny enough, just to interject there, if you go back to, you know, the 90s when I was a kid, and there would be shows, The Ricky Lake Show, Phil Donahue, Jerry Springer Show. These were shows that were not news at all. But well, there was they news were, at the end of some of them, like well, <laughs> if you were the father. Or yes, not. if you, Maury Povich, Montel Williams. Those were shows that were shows. They weren't news. Yeah. They were driven by personality. Right. But now that's been replaced, whereas... It used to be tabloid. Now mainstream journalism mm -hmm. is characterized by an individual's name. Right. One of the things, so it, this book I've referenced multiple times, Amusing Ourselves to Death, written in the 1980s. Uh, the copy that we have was written maybe in the early 2000s with a new foreword. And it was this, uh, I think it was Postman's son reflecting on the impact of his book. And he, he shares a story from a college class that was reading this book. And the college professor said, um, essentially, the assignment was find a channel on television that is not mm. for the purpose of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And so they just start going through, like, obviously, okay, Comedy Central is for the purpose of entertainment. ESPN is for the purpose of entertainment. Um, all these different spinoffs of, like, the CW, the, mm -hmm. of, those are entertainment. But even they got down to, like, the Weather Channel and said, oh, the Weather Channel is not for entertainment. It's for weather. Except when Jim Cantore is wearing his storm slicker out in the rain, yep. risking his life Top for us. Top 10 tornadoes of all time. <laughs> let's rank the most destructive hurricanes yeah. and of let's all watch them. time. Let's watch them. Right. And so you have even the Weather Channel. And so the conclusion of this class was the only channel on television that's not for the purpose of entertainment is C-SPAN. And no one watches it. Right. 
And so when we, when we look at it from that angle, Chris, we see that, that the, the idea that I have to get your attention, keep your attention, amuse you, mm-hmm. entertain you, is pervasive in, in every channel. Yep. And, and we have to know that particularly when we're looking at news channels, because if we don't turn our brains on and say, oh, they're trying to spin something this way or that way, then we're liable to receive it carte blanche yep. instead of receiving it as at least partially diluted by entertainment. And I'm not even just talking about um, something like a, a news channel that is clearly opinion-based, mm-hmm. but and, you know, I got friends still on the news. I'm not trying to, to speak poorly, but even the way that news is structured. So when there's something called the A block in in local news, you have usually A, B, C, D, and E mm. are the blocks of news. A is the longest, it's the first, it's the hardest hitting, it's where you're finding things about break-ins, drugs, murder, sexual assault. Mm-hmm. It's, and, and the phrase is, if it bleeds, it leads, mm. right? If it bleeds, it leads, it's gonna be attention grabbing, if it's important. Now, yeah. now, oftentimes the bleeding is the most important. If someone dies, sure. if there's a massive car wreck, but that's the A block. However, you never end the A block with blood. Hmm. So if it bleeds, it leads, but there's something interesting. You have to end the A block with happiness. Really? Because people won't come back if you if you go to commercial and they're sad. Okay. <laughs> so so think about it. If you watch either of the news stations here in town, the likelihood overwhelmingly four out of five days or whatever is you're gonna have the hardest hitting, most gruesome the roughest news stories, and then you're gonna end with something about the community or something hmm. about and then the lead-in to commercial is probably going to be coming up next, important story, and dog has a birthday party. <laughs> Once again, w- there, we have to so, – so another part of television news is I have to keep you watching. Sure. And, and generally, people don't want to keep watching if they're, they have a negative emotion. You want to see that birthday party. I wanna, yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, I, I like dogs. I like birthday parties. Yeah. What if he eats a cake? What if? What and if? so even in the structure of the news cycle, and then guess what? The E block, the last block, is mm-hmm. almost always light, heartfelt. You know, someone celebrates their 104th anniversary. Or 100 oh, 104th, 104th anniversary. anniversary. Wow. <laughs> that should lead. That should That's lead. the E block, my friend. That's the Their 104th block. birthday. <laughs> mm, beautiful old grandma. Yeah. Because, once again, I have to leave you with a certain emotion. And, and when we... When we see that, I don't think there's anything wrong with leaving happy, but it just it just shows that uh, people who purvey news feel a need to give you certain emotions based on certain content. Right. And then how much more, given the fact that most of our news organizations now are pretty unapologetically leaning left right. or right. So they're not only biased in the presentation of the news, but they want to inf- entertain you with their bias. Mm-hmm. And if you're not aware of that, then you're going to, you're you're gonna lose, I think. Yep. Um, as we think about entertaining versus informing, an- another thing we can talk about, Chris. Our first episode in this media diet series was about triviality and significance. Um, I think trying to entertain people necessarily trivializes content. Hmm. So let's say you know we're preaching a sermon on Sunday, mm-hmm. and we might have some significant content yeah. about the nature of God, about the nature of humanity, about the destiny of humanity. Or, the, or I mean, I have some, but as soon as I start feeling the need to joke mm-hmm. or the need not only to tell a story that is illuminating and helpful, but funny mm-hmm. and attention grabbing, I'm necessarily dumbing down that content, mm-hmm. right? Um, how do you sense that as even as we're doing this podcast or as you're preaching or as you've watched the news, how do you sense that that relationship of entertainment value and the diminishing of the the significance of content? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I, I think and, and this is not to, you know, just throw a grenade out there, but I, I just I, threw one at the news. Oh, there you go. You Love did. you guys. You did. But I I do think that it's unfortunate that and, and what's interesting is that Postman himself actually, like he, he says something about Billy Graham and um, George Burns. Mm-hmm. And George Burns's, you know, I'm alive one more year, birthday party, entertaining people kind of thing. 
and he used a term that I thought was really interesting because he, he said, theologians like, and then he filled it in with the names of entertainers. And, and I was just like, that's really interesting that he is willing to, because this is a tongue-in-cheek reference. Do you remember who he referenced at that point? Um, they were individuals of significance 30 years ago. Okay. So I, I can't remember the exact names, but the, the point being that as, as he draws this out, he is referencing the fact that people are consuming ideas of significance from entertainers. Mm -hmm. And they're drawing this like, I, I should... I should believe this mm -hmm. because somebody who makes me feel entertained says I should feel enter entertained and I should believe it. Well, why not? Let's mm -hmm. put these things together. Let's put these two things together. Um, so remind me of your original question so I'm that I can follow up on that. We're looking at how entertainment value and the desire to With keep preaching. your attention. With yeah. preaching, yeah, thank you. So mm -hmm. um, so as as preachers take cues from the culture and they, they think, how do I get people in the doors? I need to meet budget. I need to feel important in my role. And this is a temptation that we as pastors are constantly facing. A surefire way to do that is say, well, if people are tuning in for this reason, I can ensure they'll tune into me mm -hmm. for the same reason. And so I can kind of, and, and pun intended here, I can baptize culture and I can baptize it with biblical content so that people are really going to get the best of both worlds. And in many respects, I, I would think, in, in our camp at least theologically, we would argue that you get neither the best of either world. You mm -hmm. know, like you really don't. The, the secular culture can do secular culture very well, much better than the church can. And the, the Bible does not need any help to be relevant, and so you're just going to lose out on both fronts. Mm -hmm. And, and so, unfortunately, the way that people then function is they say, well, we can do this, but they end up losing because all they're really trying, all they're really ending up doing is they're recultivating the same appetites in their hearers so that when they go home, they're not actually clamoring for more Bible, they're mm. clamoring for more entertainment. And so it feeds itself then in this cycle within the church of saying, I should look for a church or I should listen for preaching that does these things, and it's not simply the culture's fault at that point. It's the fault of countless preachers who have determined that the most helpful thing for them is to entertain others. Mm -hmm. And in the process, they cheat those that they are responsible for feeding and nourishing. They cheat them out of what will actually be best for them. Yeah, and so you're, at that point, you're, you're kind of like, you're, I don't know, you're looking at the window dressings. Like that's what, and, and I want to make a distinction here between engagement and entertainment. Right. So engagement seeks to say, how can I present what I have to say in the most compelling way, mm -hmm. in the most organized way, in the most... Or even relatable. Yeah. In the mo so how can I, you're right, when you think theologically, there's a way in which you and I will talk to one another when mm -hmm. we're just having lunch because we went to the same school, we know right. some of the same terms, that we're just not going to talk on Sunday. Right. It, it wouldn't relate to people. Exactly. Um, I would have to spend 14 minutes explaining what soteriology is, even though everyone already knows what it means. Right. They know the concept. They just don't know the word. Yeah. And so I'm not being relatable there. Mm -hmm. So you, we can change our forms of communication to be more engaging. But all of that, the purpose is, I have something to say, and I want you mm -hmm. to hear it. Mm -hmm. and, and the only thing that matters is the something. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a, an enormous difference when you're talking about trying to be engaging versus entertaining. The the chief purpose of entertaining is I want you to I want you to feel something. Mm -hmm. um, and that's this is may feel like a hairline distinction here, Chris. But biblically, we believe that truth informs and leads to feelings, not vice versa. So the, the we're not leading with some sort of emotive environment that if we can make you feel a certain way, you'll understand the truth. We're leading with a message, and right. the message is true, and if we can get you to understand the message, then God, in his grace, makes you feel a certain way quite often. And, and then I, just to put an, an, <clears throat> a finisher on that, it's not just then for us to communicate something so people feel it, but it's then action. It's action at the end of that. Preaching necessarily calls for action, and so entertainment calls for feeling almost exclusively. Mm -hmm. It doesn't call for thought and it doesn't call for action. It calls for feeling. And so in preaching, we're calling people to think, which then influences the emotives. Mm -hmm. And then from the emotion, what do I do with this? Mm -hmm. What do I do with this feeling of 
guilt? What do I do with this feeling of sorrow? What do I feel or when, when I feel joyful over a truth communicated about the gospel? What do I do with that? Preaching calls for action. And when entertainment-based preaching exists, it exists simply so somebody feels something. And yeah. you know, we'll, we'll throw the name out there, a Joel Osteen. He literally will just tell jokes sometimes. There's nothing that's calling for action in that. You look throughout the Bible, preaching is constantly calling for action. Mm -hmm. Changes in behavior, repentance, a rethinking of things. And when you get to Osteen type preaching, it's just, I want you to feel good. Yeah. I want you to feel good. That's it. Yeah. And so if we're if we're kind of coming back to our first episode where we distinguish between the trivial and the significant, I think maybe one of the things we're getting at is like distinguish those two. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you mentioned that a lot of times we go to the trivial or the insignificant because it's safe, it doesn't call us to action, and have those times. I think one of the, the toughest parts for, for me right now in determining what television show to watch is it seems like people are blurring the lines. And so not only are, is a show trying to be funny, but they're trying to show me that a homosexual couple is normative and beautiful. Persuading to a and world. And so yeah. you're, you're blurring the lines here. Mm-hmm. Like it can't just be trivial for right. me anymore. And that's, that's the, one of the, part of the nature of being a Christian right now yeah. is a lot of the trivial things cannot just be trivial. And you need to be aware of that. Right. Someone's trying to significantly change you. I mean, there's, yep. there are sociological studies about how the show Modern Family and Will and Grace changed people's views mm. on the goodness of homosexuality. Mm-hmm. And so... That's the other end of the spectrum is even entertainment is trying to become significant right. or news media is trying to entertain. And as Christians, I think we have to look at those things and say, there are times in my life that are supposed to be significant. The Sunday gathering, um, the pondering of weighty Christian matters, biblical matters with other believers in Christ. Um, and then there are times that are meant for triviality, for play, for enjoyment. Right. And, and when we cross those boundaries, a lot of the times it leads to confusion. Because now we don't know if we're being entertained or informed. Yeah. We don't know if we're being informed or entertained. And we need to be able to distinguish those things. Um, I think in part because, Chris, the, the traditional distinguishes logos, ethos, and pathos, right? Mm. Um, lo- logos, logos is uh, thought or logic. Ethos, uh, like ethic. Mm. And pathos, emotion. Mm. And the more and more people entertain as they deliver a message, the more they are trying to to instill a certain emotion in you and then lead that to a messaging. Mm -hmm. Um, And we have to know that. We have to know that people are trying to make me feel a certain way Mm -hmm. so that they can get their messaging across. So be aware as you're listening. I mean, here's here's one thing. We know that news and and media are entertaining because it's only attractive people giving us the news. (laughs) Yeah. They know that it, the ugly, nerdy-looking scientist doesn't exactly draw the eyeballs. Right. So when you're evaluating who to listen to, f- stop and think, do I only listen to this person because they're funny, they're persuasive, or they're attractive? Mm-hmm. Do I, do I, is there anybody that... Carl Truman's not a particularly good-looking guy. I don't know if you... Say see, it ain't so, Josh. He's Come a on. balding Irishman, right? Like he, but he's so helpful. But our culture doesn't value a guy like Carl Truman mm. because of the way he looks. He's mm-hmm. short. He's not particularly in shape. And we have to step back and say, actually, he's one of the most valuable people right now. Sure. Um, and I have to get past his looks in order mm-hmm. to get there. So thanks for taking some time to think.